if I'm if someone takes their blood fasting blood glu glucose level in the morning, is that all they need to do, or is there other tests you think we should be doing to monitor our blood sugar? Okay, so there's a couple of different tests that I would recommend. Your fasting blood glucose is is a indicator of what's called your basal glucose metabolism. And what that means is that it's a, it's a test that determines whether your liver and pancreas are functioning properly to be able to control your blood glucose in an ideal range, which is between 70 and hundred or 70 and 99, if you will. Okay. So what that tests is effectively what is happening while there is no active calorie digestion or active food metabolism. What it doesn't measure is what happens to you after you consume a meal. Okay. So that it refers to uh, a different state of glucose metabolism that happens in the post meal state. And in order for you to determine whether or not your post meal glucose metabolism is in an ideal state, what I would recommend doing is measure your blood glucose about two hours after you consume a meal. And if you measure your blood glucose two hours after you consume a meal, the target number to look for is less than 140. And if it is less than 140, then you're in a very good state of healthy postprandial glucose metabolism. But if you find that that number is greater than 140, especially if it's towards 160, 180, or sometimes even 200, then you're in a state where your glucose metabolism post-meal is, uh, is in a you know, potentially dangerous state that can require some intervention in changing the foods that you're eating. So there's another you, test. Sorry, go ahead. You got it. The, the last test I'll talk about here is called an A1C test. And an A1C measures your three month average blood glucose. Your three month average blood glucose is very important because it's sort of, uh, it, it ta it's a mathematical calculation that takes into account all the highs, all the lows, and all the in range blood glucose values that happen over the course of approximately 90 days. You can go get that with your doctor. You can say, hey, what's my A1C? And they usually screen you for it on an annual basis anyway. And the goal is to keep that number at uh, 5.6 or below. And if you can keep that number 5.6 or below, that means that you're in a non-diabetic state. If it's between 5.7 and 6.4, that means that you're in a pre-diabetic state. And if it's 6.5% or greater, that means you're verging in the world of type 2 diabetes. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, Cyrus, if someone... Uh, does fat, does the, the 16, eight intermittent fasting, they do exercise, they follow your diet recommendations and they still don't have their blood glucose low enough. What do you say to a person like that? Does that happen? It does happen. It does happen. It happens in a very small percentage of all individuals. And usually in that state, the reason for that is because there's another culprit behind the scenes that's called C peptide. So um, C peptide is spelled the letter C dash P E P T I D E. And what C peptide is, is effectively, it is a, it is a protein that is covalently attached to insulin at the time that it is secreted into your blood. So beta cells manufacture insulin. And at the moment they put insulin into your blood, the C the insulin is connected to C peptide intracellularly. And the second it's secreted, boom, it's cut so that you actually have two different proteins that go into circulation. One of them is called insulin. One of them is called C-peptide. Insulin goes on to do its job and stimulate glucose uptake. C-peptide is inert. It basically has no biological function that we know of. But the reason why it's important is because it is used as a marker of how much insulin was secreted because insulin is metabolized relatively quickly. And C-peptide has a very long half-life that's up to about five times as long as insulin. So if you go get your C-peptide measure, uh, sorry, if you go get your C peptide level measured, what that can give you is an indicator as to whether or not your, the amount of insulin that your pancreas is capable of secreting is low, medium, or high. And what you're looking for is either a low or high value What that. What that means is that if I, you go get your C peptide tested and your C peptide comes back at, let's say between three and four, that means that you're, you're pancreas is capable of manufacturing a, plenty of insulin. And that's not the problem. But if you get your C-peptide measured and your C-peptide comes back between one and three, that means that you, your pancreas is compromised and having a difficult time secreting insulin. And it's definitely worth knowing that you have to take some invasive actions. And if your C-peptide comes back and it's at a one or lower, that means that your pancreas is definitely struggling to manufacture insulin. 
And that right there could be the reason why your blood glucose is high, despite the fact that you're eating a low fat plant-based whole food diet and you're exercising and you're performing intermittent fasting. Okay. So people who have a low C-peptide value effectively have a struggling pancreas and their beta cell collection and their beta cell population has burned out over the course of time. And those individuals may have to use insulin in the future in order to prevent their blood glucose from going high. And um, it, again, it happens to a very small percentage of all people, but it's definitely an indicator and it's definitely something to measure if lifestyle doesn't work. Um, what about this new uh, diabetic drug Ozempic that people are using for weight loss and other drugs that are similar to that? Yeah. Okay. So I just did a, a very long piece on Ozempic and whether or not it's smart or not, not. So Ozempic is what's called a GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is just a long way of basically saying that it is a, it is a drug that is designed to stimulate to the receptors, um, uh, the GLP-1 receptors. And so the GLP-1 receptors are, are endogenous to your digestive system, and they have a whole collection of metabolic functions. But one of the primary ways that, that Ozempic works is by effectively activating stretch receptors inside of your small intestine. And activating those stretch receptors sends a neurological signal up to your brain that says, hey, brain, there's something inside of me. Slow down the rate at which you're asking for food. So you can think of it as a phone call that starts in your digestive system and goes up to your brain and basically says, hey, could you slow down I already have stuff inside of me and that's why the walls of the small intestine are distending. And so in that, in that scenario, your brain says, okay, cool. I got the phone call. Sounds like a plan. I'm going to slow down how much food I'm asking for. And then it reduces your appetite. Okay. So as a result of that, when you use Ozempic, the GLP one receptor agonist, it basically tricks your digestive system into thinking that there's something inside of it. It initiates a phone call up to your brain. Your brain goes, okay, cool, sweet. There's something inside of my digestive system when there in reality isn't. I'm going to reduce my hunger signal. And as a result of that, you are less hungry. By being less hungry, you don't eat as much food. You lower your calorie intake. And then boom, before you know it, over the course of a year, you've lost 16% of your body weight. That's what the studies show. The studies that are published in the New England Journal of Medicine demonstrate that Ozempic is a ridiculously powerful weight loss drug because it utilizes it, it exploits this pathway between your digestive system and your brain. Here's the problem. As soon as you stop taking Ozempic, guess what happens? Any ideas? Gain weight back. Gain the weight back. Exactly right. Okay. So if you want to be taking Ozempic, which number one is expensive, number two requires an injection, which can be uncomfortable. And number three uh, can also have some um, some, what's the word I'm looking for? So some side effects, that, digestive side effects. Um, if you want to be taking it for many years, then go for it, take it, right? But here's the problem. Number one, it's expensive. Number two, there's some not so fun side effects that come along for the ride. Um, but number three, it's a Band-Aid, okay? It's a, it's a short-term solution that, it's a short-term solution to a long-term problem. If you really want to lose weight and lose that 16% of your body weight or lose 10% of your body weight or 20% of your body weight, then what I would recommend is change your lifestyle by, again, eating a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, moving your body, and performing intermittent fasting. Guess what? It's going to take a while, and that's okay, right? It's going to take a while. It could take six months. It could take a year. It could take two years. But the truth is that when you change your lifestyle, then you're, end you're going to end up creating a whole system a whole collection of, of habits that are going to transform your physical health, your emotional health, and your mental health. And that's going to be a long-term solution that's going to prevent you from yo-yo dieting and losing the weight and then gaining it back and then losing the weight and then gaining it back and then getting frustrated over the course of time. People who gravitate towards Ozempic um, generally do so because they're looking for a quick fix. And that's not meant to be a judgment in any way, shape, or form, but Ozempic is a pharmaceutical medication that's designed to work quickly and prevent you from having to change your lifestyle. I'm always a proponent of lifestyle change. And trust me, there's some grunt work involved in it and it's monotonous and it's tedious and it can be boring, but you know what? In the long term, that's how you make positive change in your body. And that's how you lower your chronic disease risk. And that's how you make 
permanent change.